This is Dr. Warren Vanderhill interviewing Dr. John Barber for the Ball State History Project on September 28, uh, 2004. Uh, John, I'd like you to begin, if you would, by telling me a little bit about your educational background before you came to Ball State, where you got your degrees, the other places you may have taught, et cetera. Okay. Um, I got my undergraduate degree in a small liberal arts. Southern Baptist College in Jackson, Tennessee, called Union University, which really wasn't a university. Uh, majored in history there, and intended to major in art because I was going to be a commercial artist, but they didn't have an art major, so I majored in history and then taught history 42 years. <laughs> <laughs> went to Vanderbilt immediately after I, I did the undergraduate degree in four years, went straight to Vanderbilt University in Nashville, Tennessee for a master's degree. Uh, finished that in a calendar year, and uh, Got a job offer at, in a junior high in uh, the, the Davidson County, where Nashville was, and but also an offer from my undergraduate alma mater to go back there and teach. So a year after I graduated from Union, I was back there teaching, taught there three years with a master's degree. When I got there, there were three people that did all the history and social science, and I was a fourth person. And uh, the Europeanist had one, <laughs> said she was retiring the next year, so I'd be a European historian. Because <laughs> I had teach their European history. Um, I went back to Vanderbilt after teaching there three years and, uh, and left their ABD in three years with a uh, major in modern European history. Went back to Union for a year. Uh, they kept wanting me to teach Baptist by, uh, history, and I, and I just said, well, I don't, know, I don't think I can do that. So I left after a year. Uh, went to Southeast Missouri State College, uh, State College, about 5,000 students in Cape Girardeau. Is that, is that the only job you applied for then? Yeah, okay. that and and Ball State in a way, except they asked me to both and both. Yeah, yeah, that was the only one I applied for. Okay, uh, and that was you know 1967, 68, right. really wild and crazy times. Um, and uh, the school administration was extremely authoritarian. It was sort of about seven days in May kind of people mm -hmm. who saw a communist under every desk, right. and uh, the faculty and administration were constantly at war with each other, and. They, they fired some uh, eight professors uh, at the end of my first year there. They fired them on the last day of exam week, and uh, most of them didn't think they could even get a position for the coming uh, school year, and so the faculty really blew up then, and um, there were about 300 faculty members, and we had uh, we called our own faculty meetings, which was illegal. Well, according to the, our faculty handbook, at least you couldn't do that, but we did. and. Um, well, to make a really long and interesting story for me short, um, 100 of us signed letters saying that they didn't rectify that wrong they had done in firing those people without cause. They really didn't show cause. Um, but several were known to be very liberal. A couple were rumored to be uh, homosexuals. Um, a couple were Jews. And we thought that there was probably some, something ideological behind that. <laughs> in fact, one claimed to be a Marxist, and we thought he was just funny. Uh, <laughs> So we, we wrote a hundred of us signed letters saying we'd quit if they didn't do something about that wrong. And what the administration finally did was rehire them for the summer and said they're out in the fall. Uh, Thirty some odd of us said that's not good enough. We'd, we'd quit. And so um, Ball State had, had asked me the previous year if I wanted to come here to the department head. And I said, no, no, I just got here. I'm going to stay a while. And I just got back in touch with the history department of Ball State and said, I, I'm interested. And so uh, Miller Mayfield came down and interviewed oh. me <laughs> on a Sunday morning, offered me a cocktail. I, I, I said, no, I'm skipping Sunday school, and I don't think I'll have a cocktail. And uh, uh, came up here for an interview and came in the fall of 69, uh, interviewed by Dean Carmen. You know, oh, yeah. Uh, oh, well, I remember. Things I asked him were things that, that came straight out of my experience at Cape Girardeau. I said, is it okay if I grow a beard? <laughs> Do I have to wear a tie? Things like yeah. that, you know. As he puffed away on one of his green cigars. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and it was a very good interview. I, I was really impressed with the uh, attitude of the administrators and faculty members I talked to, you know, about uh, faculty rights and responsibilities and all that kind of thing. And the emphasis on teaching, um, I was really gung-ho, you know, about doing right. great things in teaching. Yeah. And it all sounded wonderful to me, and it was. But what were your expectations when you came here? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Everybody well, says that. Yeah. Well, I, really, I... What I was just talking about yeah. were the expectations that were most important to me. Is this going to be a place where faculty members really do have some rights and, and where academic freedom is, is genuine? Like in, in at Southeast Missouri State, uh, faculty members were told that not only that they were expected to wear a uh, coat and tie, they didn't say what the women were supposed to wear, right. um, but we were also uh, 
informed either directly, some people were, or not me, directly or indirectly, we were expected to go to church. And, and you know, not just right. do something religious or right. something right. sacred, but it was go to church. And they meant, you know, preferably either Catholic or Protestant, right. and maybe preferably Protestant. But, you know, state college, you know, where things like that were done, um, I, I wanted to get away from, from that kind of, of uh, really oppressive atmosphere. and, and so my expectation was that this would be a place where that would not exist, and it didn't. And uh, for, for me personally, maybe for some other people, they felt some of that, but I never did. Okay. And, and I also wanted a place, which Cape Girardeau, uh, uh, St uh, Seymour State had also offered in, in a lot of respects, a place where, where I, I could have the resources, um, both material resources and, and otherwise, and the circumstances where I could do some, some really new things in teaching. I'd already started experimenting a lot with, with different ways to teach and didn't really know what I wanted to do, but I knew I wanted to try some things w without getting um, dismissed because of what I wanted to try, because it was kind of unorthodox. And it, it seemed to me that from everything I uh, found out in the interviews uh, and from people I talked to at parties like at your house, uh, that th this was a place where I could do that kind of teaching. And uh, I, I was always interested in, in research and love research and writing, but my strongest orientation by far was toward teaching. And, and so it seemed like, well, this was not a publish or perish uh, institution. Right. And that, that was my expectation, okay. that I could, I could publish if I wanted to, but if I didn't, I wanted to concentrate on teaching, that, that's okay too. In fact, it seemed that some people in the administration at least preferred that. Right. And, and so those were my expectations about this, this place as, uh, as a higher educational institution. Well, this is probably follows then naturally from that, but why, why did you stay here? Uh, it was more personal. I, uh, well, the professional side of it was just just those things. Uh, those were my expectations, and, and, and I realized those expectations. I, people like Vic Lawhead, who, who was the uh, dean of undergraduate right. studies, is that what it was? Yeah, undergraduate and, programs. Undergrad, undergraduate programs. Uh, he did so much. To, to create the kind of situation that I wanted as a faculty member. Um, and, and everybody in the administration that I worked with, and most of them not very directly, Vic directly a lot, mm -hmm. were supportive. Uh, John Pruce, uh, I got to know, because he came the year before I, I did, mm -hmm. and I got to know him because I, you know, I'd end up speaking somewhere, an honors thing or whatever, and he'd be there and we'd talk. And uh, he found out what I was interested in. I started teaching this. The, they changed the general studies program in 1970 after I'd been here right. a year. And um, I got one of the uh, um, interdisciplinary uh, colloquia that students could take to get off their intro course credit. And so I got the social science one, that, and I, they, they told me what, the, in general, what they wanted me to do, the kinds of topics to deal with, how the course should be structured, and that sort of thing. But they really left you know, all the ta details of content up to me. And I decided that a lot of the current issues and the historical backgrounds for those issues that, that they said were the kinds of things they wanted people to deal with, like war and student uh, uh, discontent and, and racial relations, those kinds of things, I, that I could deal with those in, a, in an organized way by concentrating on violence. And so I made it a colloquium on violence, and then after a few years I, I made it a colloquium on violence and peacemaking. And I uh, had a faculty committee that's, that was sort of the watchdog group for that course to make sure I was doing good, solid work that I had to report to regularly in writing and orally, and uh, Vic, and we worked pretty closely with Vic. Uh, and when, when, when John Proust found out I was teaching this course, well, he would do things like send me a, 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 something to read, you know, some, something that had come across his desk he thought I'd be interested in. And just that kind of supportiveness, you know, was, was so good for me to help me do what I wanted to do that, you know, why take the chance of going somewhere where it was going to be uh, the wrong kind of place, when I found the right kind of place to do what I wanted to do. Um, the, the film services, you know, back then it was this little old thing crammed down in the basement of uh, what is now North Quad, yeah. and uh, it was Basil Rittenberger and Sylvia Powers and yeah. a few people like that. That was film services and, uh, and some students who worked there a lot. Right. Well, the, when I, you know, I, I was started using, I started doing multimedia right. in class, right. and, I, and so I, I wanted certain films to use in a certain way, and I wanted a bunch of machines to show it with, and, and they were just so good, you know, to help me get those things done that I wanted to do. Uh, so all the way from those kind of staff people down there to the department where Everett Farrell you know, wanted, wanted me to finish my dissertation um, and yet also have, have a chance to teach like I wanted to, so he helped me get a schedule and enough secretarial help. 
uh, that, that I could do what I wanted to do. I was writing a lot of stuff for this class. And back then, you know, we were typing ditto paper and correcting with, with a razor blade. And it took a lot of time. And so, it, you know, I'd have 20 hours a week of, of student secretarial help to get those kind of things done. And so, you know, it, at, at wherever I turned, I found these people uh, in, in upper administration, lower administration, staff people, the, uh, faculty members, uh, people in the department like Everett, uh, who, who helped me do what I wanted to do and get my dissertation done. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, they set me up a, a Monday through Thursday schedule in, in courses, in, back in the quarter system, and then I had Friday, Saturday, Sunday to work on my dissertation. And I did that for three years. Yeah, I'm laughing because I had the same kind of deal with Farrell when I came here to get done. I mean, Everett was just great yeah. at helping young people finish their dissertation. So is it fair to say that during the time you were here, this long, illustrious career, that you never really gave any serious thought to going someplace else? No, I never really did. Okay. Um, I, and, and again, the professional side of it, uh, at one point, made me want to, to get out of the history department. Right. Uh, there were there was a, about a three or four year period when uh, there was a chair that right. I just didn't get along with. I tried, I really tried, yeah. but it's like you know nothing I did was right. And so, uh, the kind of university this is, and I suspect many are that way. A faculty member, uh, once they're tenured, can. Um, and sort of hide out and just do their own thing right. and, and avoid even the department chair, which right. I did. Because yeah. I had enough support in the department otherwise that right. uh, I could stay away from that person and, and get along fine. Right. And I don't think it even slowed down my promotions or anything, right. Right. despite our conflicts. But yeah. it was un unpleasant enough for me that I thought, well, maybe I'll go into continuing education. <laughs> or, or maybe I'll, I'll yeah. since I'm teaching this interdisciplinary social science yeah. course, maybe I can find a some kind of interdisciplinary place to be and not be in the history faculty anymore. Find a refuge. Yeah, so I did think about running away from the department that, that brief period. But, but that, that was that was like three years out of 33. Yeah. But not the institution. Not the institution. Never did. In what ways do you think Ball State changed during your career? <laughs> well, you can already hear some of it from what I said, <laughs> if you know what it's like now. Um, I thought about this when I was biking over this morning. I yeah. thought, okay, I'm biking up to this building and yeah. there's Bracken Library yeah, over right. there. And there's a new music building over there, and I thought, okay, bricks. <laughs> there are a lot more okay. bricks than there right. used to be. Okay. Right. And when I parked my bike, I said I could hardly find a place to park my bike. You can't. You've never been able to park a car no, at man. Ball State. And and so I said, okay, more bricks, more bikes. Yeah. And I couldn't think of another B. But the <laughs> <laughs> another thing that's that's really different is there there are not only as we were talking before we started taping, there are a lot of layers of paper. That is, a lot of paperwork that you have to do because somebody up the line or down the line somewhere needs some paperwork done. Right. Um, there's a lot, lot more of that, and that was one, one of the few things that the last, uh, I don't know, maybe decade that I was here, that I got really tired of, because a lot of it seemed so useless. You know, it was, it was like busy work, and and that is related to another change that I guess is obvious to almost anybody. I think there, there are clearly a lot more layers of administration. Right. Like when I came here, you know, we had the president and a vice president, one, and the deans, mm -hmm. and if there were assistant deans, I didn't even know it. Well, you know, now you'll have several vice presidents and associate vice presidents and associate provost and assistant provost and, and two assistant deans and, and all that kind of stuff. And some of that is good and necessary, but um, the good and some of the good and necessary, for example, is uh, my first years here when I found out we had a, an international studies program, it was Phyllis Juhas, who was a history faculty member and and her and, and the international programs for her was a part-time job. Right, she was teaching right. maybe three courses, I don't know, and then right. international programs. She was running that, and um, and there was one person working full-time, uh, just retired. Uh, uh, was it Jay Park? No, no. Oh. Uh, uh, it'll come to me eventually. Okay. Kirk. Roby. Oh, Kirk Roby. Yeah. yeah right, I think yeah. I don't know when he came in, right. but that was international programs. Well, now you know they they sort of taken over. Yeah. The student center. <laughs> it's now an empire. <laughs> yeah, and and they've got a director and they've got a vice president up there, I guess now who's yeah. got something to do with their national programs, and there there probably are too many people in that structure. Maybe I'm not sure, but uh, Ball State, you know, in the last uh, years of the, of the last century, was was set, I was told ranked about tenth in in, in numbers of students or or percentage of students studying abroad. Well, I, that's a wonderful thing, you know. Yeah, right. And um, o over my years here, I kept changing uh, mm -hmm. my career in a way. I, I taught that interdisciplinary yeah. course on violence and peacemaking 16 years, and then I started teaching a required uh, Western Civ class and quit that. 
And, uh, and so that was a big thing for me from mid-80s into the 90s. And then in 1993, I became director of the London Center program and then taught in London for a semester. And from 90, early 94 un, until I became chair of the department in 1999, my big thing was, was study abroad and taking students uh, on study right. tours and that yeah. kind of thing. Um, administration, bigger administration, more complex administration, is, is necessary to have us become what we've become in international programs. And so I think that's, that's a great kind of adding on layers. Mm -hmm. The others I'm, I'm not as sure about. Okay. Um, and it, it, because even though having been here so long, if I wanted to do something as chair of the three years before I retired in 2002, or as a faculty member before that, um, I knew enough people in administration, enough faculty members that you know I, I, I wouldn't know who to talk to or who to send a memo to right. to get things done. I think if I came in now as a new faculty member, this kind of, of a more elaborate administrative structure would be a lot less fun <laughs> to, to work with, a lot harder to work with yeah. than, than the one that I came into, which is really much more personal. So think about for a minute, uh, which is part of the reason why I'm doing this study, that people like us represent a significant number of faculty who came to a Ball State that was one thing and retired from the Ball State that was something entirely different. And what I mean by that is really the changes that began to be implemented quite forcefully by Jim Cook when he was mm -hmm. provost in the uh, early to mid-80s. And I'm speaking specifically of the change from a fixed salary schedule to the merit market system, mm -hmm. the change from having essentially few standards for the attainment of tenure, few standards for promotion to associate and full professor, and the fact that during the four or so year period that Jim was provost, that changed markedly. Mm -hmm. So that your life and my life when we came here was one thing in terms of our advancement up the academic ladder of success, if you will. And then when you became chair in particular, you were the chair of a big department at a university that had changed markedly right. in the way that faculty members were treated in regard to pay, uh, tenure, and promotion. Yep. Well, yep. I probably, because of things that went on the last uh, several years that I was on the faculty, I probably should start out by talking about that as, as a change that I, I've seen. And, and um, you know, I believe in, in high standards, and I, I want people to be uh, gung-ho, hard-working, first-rate university teachers, and if they want to, researchers and writers. Uh, but I, I think it's, uh, I saw what happened. We, we, we became, in the history department, a publisher parish department. And, uh, and, and that was most evident by the early 1990s, I guess, or thereabout. It started happening in the last half of the 80s. And it seemed to me that it was, it, was a lot, it was a lot more our department, some people in our department, than it was Cook or anybody else in the administration. Because uh, right down to the day I retired, it seemed to me that the upper administration was much more reasonable and flexible about those standards. So that, you know, if you didn't have a book, uh, well, okay. Are you are you still at least a good first-rate researching scholar? Right. And it was it was sort of the the Ernest Boy is it Ernest Boyer? Ernest Boyer. Yeah. It was sort of the Boyer idea of well, we want to know when if you're going to be a faculty member that you have the ability in your field to do research right. and publication. Right. But uh, Boyer argued that that you know you should decide at some institutional level, I guess, right. whether or not that means you're going to be publishing regularly uh, for the rest of your career, or you're going to be doing something different. Right. And and it, it seemed to me that he was saying that uh, he probably thought uh, that it would be a good thing to let a faculty member decide my emphasis is going to be as it used to be here, you know, mostly teaching and some research, or almost all teaching and very little research, or, or a great deal of research and less emphasis right. on time and effort in teaching. Right. Um, and it seemed to me that the administration is, was more inclined to be somewhat flexible about that than, than, than some part of our department. And the promotion and tenure committees in the 90s um, which always had seven people on it, uh, and, and they, because you had to be sort of senior people, um, it, the, the department of faculty as a whole was not that rigid and inflexible about it, but the, from year to year, you, you, you would have like every other year or so, and usually it's every other year, a majority on the promotion to tenure committee that really wanted to make it publish a book in, during your probationary period as a faculty member or you're out. Okay. And, and they were very straightforward about that. Mm -hmm. And I thought that was wrong because you, you come in, uh, you're uh, relatively young, 
uh, at least you know 30-ish, and you, you're you're married and you want to have a family, mm -hmm. and uh, and and you, you're fired up about teaching, and it takes some time, you know, to to, to mm -hmm. get set up and right. running on your courses, and yet they expect you really by you know by fourth or fifth year, you need to have a book out, and and it was it was a killing kind of yeah. policy that those people informally. It was a policy, and you know, it wasn't written down anywhere. But they made that work at times in a promotion and tenure committee, and and it I, it got rid of of uh, of a couple of people I thought were among the best teachers I and I, I know a lot about what it takes to be a good teacher. Mm -hmm. You don't have to teach like me, but sure. there are a lot of different good ways to teach. And I look closely at the way those two and, and maybe some others taught, and uh, and and thought that they were fantastic faculty members offering us a lot in teaching and in, in professional service and a little bit in publishing, but they didn't get a book or the equivalent, and so they're out. Okay. And I thought that was terribly wrong. Now I we, thought it was very So, so your view is that the, the, the departmental, the history department standard, was really far beyond what the rest of the college yeah. and the rest of the university yeah. expected. In fact, you know, I had a dean or two tell me that they thought yeah. so, and there were, other, there were faculty members in other departments who were saying, what, what, what's wrong with you people over there? Mm -hmm. you, you think you're Harvard? You're really not. You're Ball State, okay. and that's good, but it's not Harvard. Well, that, the next question, I'm sort of anticipating the answer, but I've got to ask it anyway. Do you view these kinds of changes at the university as being positive or negative? <laughs> <laughs> that one, uh, at, at our departmental level, was negative. Okay. Uh, at the university level, uh, because of the way I saw the policy applied, I thought it was positive. Okay. Because uh, it, th we got a lot more support for research, and people who were really fired up by doing research or publication found a better situation here to do it. It got the university probably a somewhat better reputation overall. Right. And uh, so I think that was a good thing. Okay. Uh, it, it's just that we, we needed something to, to function at the departmental level to be sure that we were sort of all running together in a reasonable uh, and correct direction on these policies, and I don't think it was there. The other major change in our lives here is that we significantly, in the past six, seven or so years, maybe eight now, changed the standard for admission to the institution. I mean, there are a lot of state reasons yeah. why that happened, <clears throat> yeah. and I certainly was around and had something to do with that, working with John Worthen. But I was here with Byron and others, you know, one of that open admissions Well, policy. that's my point. So we came to an institution that in many ways served a kind of community college function. Right. But it was kind of open-door admission, uh, even though we were on quarters and we deferred admission to the winter quarter or the spring quarter. It was still, if you had a high school diploma, you could probably get in here at some point during the year. During the time you were chair, and even beginning a little bit before that, the standard for admission, the bar, if you will, as the admission people like to say, was raised every year mm -hmm. a little bit to the point mm -hmm. where now it's raised quite a bit mm -hmm. from what it was when we came here in the 1960s. Did you notice that at all as far as your interaction with students? I mean, did your colleagues in the history department notice that? I mean, was there a significant improvement in the abilities of these kids, which we were, of course, basing on their high school GPAs and their SATs and stuff like that? There was a, cha a real change perception on the part of the faculty about uh, the students and what they were like and, and the quality of, of students and, 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 and the improvement that that made and, right. and the way they could t do their teaching, you know, because they had a, a better equipped right. student body. And I say perceptions, and I emphasize the word because, you know, like uh, most people didn't have a student load I did, but my t typical load before I was chair would be in the fall I'd have 420 people in a, in a, in a survey course and another 25 or so people in an upper division course, and um, it, how, you know, how do you how do you tell <laughs> how bright these right. people are in 1992 compared to 1999? Right. I, I think it's really tough to tell. But it's, you, know, if you can figure out ways to get students of almost any kind of background to do some worthwhile discussion and some worthwhile writing. Right. But you you can't just you know say like like they used to tell us, and at least they did me, and probably you too. When I had a, a, a history course as a student, they would say, do a research paper. Right. <laughs> Those were the guidelines, you know. <laughs> yeah. And and you you can't do that with students who uh, don't have whatever it is that our generation brought into right. college when there was so such a small percentage going. Uh, you have to to give us more direction, and you and you have to. You can't just, like, I, I'd get back a research paper and it had this letter grade on it and, and maybe four words, right. you know, <laughs> and that was about it. Yeah, nice work. Yeah, uh -huh. uh, <laughs> wonderful or terrible, whatever. <laughs> you, you have to, to do more to let students 
these days, uh, the kind that were coming in, in the 60s and 70s here, and I think still from, know more about them, and this is what you need to do to write better. And um, if you're doing that, it's going to be really hard to tell, okay, has our student body got a GPA that's right. this much right. higher than it used to be? Right. Uh, are, are they this much better verbally than they used to be or whatever? Right. And, and so if, if, you, if you're really loud about raising admission standards and you make a big deal about it, uh, I, think, I think it's going to make the faculty see their students differently. And there's a lot of research that shows that the main factor in, in a great grades a student gets is uh, what the faculty expects this student to get. Yeah. And I think it, if, if the faculty believes these students are better than they used to be, they will seem better to them whether or not you can really tell any difference. And so, yeah, the students seem better, discussion seems better, the papers seem better. Whether they really are or not, I yeah. think it's, it's terribly hard to tell, <laughs> if you're honest. Okay. Who are some of the people uh, at Ball State during your career that have had some influence on you. I guess I could say for good or ill. But <laughs> well, forget the ill. So, I mean, I, when you when you look back on a, a storied career here of great success, are there individuals you mentioned Dick Lawhead, and I certainly would concur in that in that view of, of people who had some influence on your work here? Yeah, in the early years, uh, uh, Vic. Well, uh, uh, for, until he retired, right. Dick Lawhead, more probably more than any other single person. Uh, you know, he was. Here's this guy who's a, who's you know oriented toward professional education, right. and it, and eventually toward administration. But you know he, he reads the Village Voice right. and the New York Times and the New Yorker and you name it. You know the whole long whatever whatever long list of, of things to read that a, a, a highly intelligent, well educated person would be reading. He was reading it, and he sent me the stuff. You know yeah. when I changed offices in about 1993 from Lucina to uh, Burkhart Building. I had a closet full of, uh, of newspapers that he had sent me, you know, sort of East Coast kind of stuff that made me just way too liberal. <laughs> no, he was. Um, and and he, he knew my, what my interests were, and, and so he, he kept sending me stuff, as you did over the years, you know. Uh, we were less in touch than, than Vic and I were mm -hmm. in, down to the 80s, but you did the same sort of thing. You would send me a, a, a title of something or a copy of something. And so that sort of thing influenced me a lot. But even more than that was uh, Vic's support and help in teaching that course on violence and peacemaking those 16 mm -hmm. years. Yeah. Um, that that was tremendous for me. If he hadn't been there, uh, I, I could not have done it, I don't think. It would have been a lot harder to do the kind of teaching I wanted to do. And it wouldn't have been nearly as enjoyable and rewarding in all kinds of ways. Everett Farrell, uh, until he, he left a uh, position of, of department chair, um, he, he did an, an awful lot, as I already said, to help me have the kind of, of situation where I could do the sort of teaching I wanted to do and also do the kind of other uh, scholarly work that I needed to do. Um, and just little, little things that, like, like the secretary of assistance and that sort of thing and scheduling. Uh, so those people especially influenced me a lot. Um, John Worthing, when he came here, um, I, I, don't know, I don't know why I was asked to do it, but uh, he had for some reason, he asked me to come in and talk with him about something I want to do to publicize Ball State a little better. He wanted to go talk to Jim Davis and see if we couldn't use Garfield uh, to to uh, get the word out about Ball State. Yeah. And so we, we rode out to the place where... Yeah. where uh, Paws Inc. Yeah, Paws Inc. I rode out there with him, and I think it was his first year here. And on the way out there, he talked about what he wanted to do as president. And I, I remember very clearly that, uh, his, uh, his emphasis on good, really high-quality undergraduate teaching. He wanted this to be a first-rate undergraduate teaching institution. Right. And I thought it was already very good, but he wanted to make it still better. Uh, and, and, and graduate studies are fine, but, you know, let's be realistic. You, you need to keep cranking out as many right. EDDs or whatever as you yeah. are, and, and it's pretty expensive, so maybe yeah. we shouldn't sort of shift yeah. the emphasis in any other direction. And, and he said he wanted us to become uh, a much stronger institution in international studies, international programs. And I said, well, yeah, you know, that sounds really good to me. And, and then he did it. Um, and I, I think that um, President Worthen's style of administration was probably not the one I would have written into the character of, of a president if I'd been doing it, because uh, I, I'm such a Democrat with a little d that I'm a little like uh, John Cougar and Mellencamp, I find authority, authority's always winning, you know, and so if somebody seems kind of authoritarian, I won't like that, 
Well, I suspect uh, President Worthing was more that way than, than I would have wanted someone to be, but it, it, it never came across that way, and it, it didn't affect me so much, I could tell, and I couldn't tell that it was affecting the rest of the university that much. It, I didn't see him having that sort of dictatorial uh, style in practice. Um, and, and maybe it's because of, of what he saw as his job as president. It wasn't his job, you know, to be day in and day out running right. the lives of faculty. Um, if it had been, it might, have, it might have felt different. But what he did do was to use his style and his definition of what a president's job was to, I think, get those things done that he talked about. Um, and, and so... So you were talking <laughs> about President Worthen and his influence on you, so we'll go from there. Okay. Okay. Um, I emphasized uh, his influence on developing international studies, international programs at Ball State, although there was a lot more that he did. And, um, and I said that, I emphasized that in this conversation about who influenced me because the it, it, it seemed like my, I, I went through these several careers, and like the interdisciplinary course, violence and peacemaking career, and then the uh, history, big history, one, Western field classes with a new style of teaching for those kinds of courses, and, and that's the 80s into the early 90s, and then early 90s till I retired, uh, the, the, the career was uh, international travel, international studies, international programs. You want to get that? Um, and. That change to that kind of concentration really started in 1988 when uh, I had a sabbatical. Does it look like it's working? Yeah. Okay. Uh, that sort of career, new career in uh, emphasizing international travel, international studies, study tours for students, and that kind of thing, uh, really got turned in that direction in 1988. Um, un until the late 80s, I, I, even though I'd been, quote, a Euro modern European historian since the early 1960s, I'd never gone to Europe. And the uh, truth of it, it was just a practical thing. I, it, it was hard to get the money with, with four children, you know, and the, they were into college and all that. Eventually, that's very expensive, and uh, I felt the obligations of family and home enough that I thought, well, I, I can't go to Europe for any extended period of time. But the children were old enough then, and my wife had a career going, so we had uh, some more money, that I decided I really wanted to go to the Soviet Union. Um, and uh, even, I'd, I'd studied French and German, uh, at, uh, and it was part of my doctoral program, I'd never studied Russian. But here I ended up teaching the Soviet course a lot, and, and they said, well, you don't have to have Russian language because we don't have a doctoral program. Uh, but I just decided that it probably would make me a better teacher of Russian Soviet history if I if I knew the language at least to some extent. So I decided I want to study Russian and I want to go to the Soviet Union. Um, so I wrote a proposal to get a sabbatical uh, and uh, worked on this in 1987, and still was hesitant about about going for a lot of reasons, but especially economic. I thought, well, it's just going to be too big a hit on our budget, and I'm not sure I want to do it. And I can't remember whether I called you and talked to you or came to see you or or sent you a memo or what, but I, I know at some point uh, I asked you if there was any faculty development money available to help me with, with the cost of studying in the Soviet Union, and, 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 I don't, and you came up with some. I don't, don't remember how much it was, and it might, might not have been a lot, but I think it, the psychology for me was if you've got this money, you can do it. And so that, that helped with faculty development grant money. Um, got me to the Soviet Union. Uh, I, I probably could have found the money somehow if I would have, but I, I probably wouldn't have. Mm -hmm. And so I studied um, in the Soviet Union and traveled uh, for six weeks in the summer of 1988, which was a fascinating time to be there. You know, these are the Gorbachev years. Mm -hmm. he, had, he had moved to the point where he was saying he was going to democratize the Soviet right. Union. Mm -hmm. And, you know, through most of, of Soviet history, they said democracy, there's no such thing as democracy in, in that sense. That's a fake that, against the working class people and all that. And now he's saying we're going to democratize the Soviet Union. It was, it was radical kind of stuff going on over there and a wonderful time to be there. So I was there right in the middle of all that studying Russian language and culture in Moscow for four weeks. And then we went to Ukraine and uh, St. Pete, well, Leningrad it still was then, 
um, and um, uh, some of the Baltic to travel through some of the Baltic states, came back uh, through Helsinki, Finland, and I, I can still remember what it was like when I landed in Copenhagen on the way over there, and then we went to Helsinki and took a train into Moscow. And I, I, was, I was so excited about going that I didn't sleep on the overnight flight. Uh, I didn't sleep on the overnight train trip from Helsinki to Moscow. I was just too excited about being there, yeah. And it, so it was exhausting and wonderfully so. And that, that just so, had such a drastic effect on my career. It changed me so much in, what, in, in my own personal study and in what I was inter interested in doing with students. So I started taking, I, I did the London Center program, was director of that in 93, and taught in the London Center program spring, whole spring semester of 94 in London. Uh, and then from that point on, I was in Europe uh, pretty consistently, once or twice or three times a year for various lengths of time. I, took, I started taking students for summer terms there and did it all through the mid to late 1990s. Um, and I loved it. it. It was, and well, okay, I don't think it would have happened if I hadn't gotten that back with development grant money in 1988. And so, you know, uh, whatever it might have meant to you, I know what it meant to me. It, it's, and it's the wise use of money. So it was a tremendous influence on my career. Well, as I said, it's just to try to find faculty with good ideas and to try to help them fulfill their dreams and aspirations. And that sounds kind of lofty, but I think that actually during the 15 years I was in the provost office, that's exactly what I tried to do. Well, you know, I, I think that's an example, though, of what I saw uh, with a lot of upper administration figures at Ball State who influenced me is that they, they kept that kind of human proportion in their in their thinking and attitude so that they, they were aware of the, of the real needs of people and they were, they wanted to really help do things and, and it you know they weren't just people up there in the structure going by the book uh, they were people up there in the structure who were still interested in in the people and faculty level and staff level and that sort of thing and that's that was worth a lot to me one of the reasons I was happy to stay here. All <laughs> Me too. Tell me a little bit about your uh, areas of involvement uh, in a university outside the department. Were there particular things that you uh, were interested in uh, that you got involved with from time to time? Yeah, and there, that, there also it was like a, there were, I went through these different phases. And in the, in the 1970s and maybe into the early 80s, for example, I was on the radio or on television just time after time after time because I was, I was doing this course on violence and peacemaking and, and even though I put everything I did in some kind of historical perspective mm -hmm. and, and a lot of it was history, it, it, it was also very current stuff. It, it fitted in with, with what was mm -hmm. uh, grabbing people's attention in, in current events. And so um, I, I'd end up on WTHR at a talk show or something like that. And one time I even took one of the multimedia things that I put together for, for the class of violence and peacemaking class down there and showed it on, on TV. And um, so I, w I was uh, interviewed by two of the three uh, network stations in Indianapolis, many, a number of times, I don't even know how many. Uh, I was on uh, WIPB quite a few times on their talk shows, um, was on uh, WBST, interviewed, well, all the local radio stations, every one of them a number of times. And there was a cable channel, I think it was, in, in Anderson that had this talk show every day. And I, I don't know how many times I was on that. And, and so, you know, I'd go somewhere and say, people say, oh, I saw you on television. Yeah. And it wasn't so much the ego thing of it as, as I was getting word out about these things that I was studying and teaching about that were so important to me and reaching a larger audience. Uh, I, did a lot of, I did a number of community programs, you know, speaking to groups of various sizes, dealing with the things I was dealing with. Um, when I did the violence and peacemaking course, one of the, of the topics that we worked on was uh, violence in the family, child abuse, spouse abuse, that sort of thing. And um, so uh, a number of, of programs grew out of that. Um, the graduate assistant of mine started uh, a community organization to try to help children who, who experienced abuse. Uh, I was uh, a member of the, I don't know if you call it a committee or not, the, the group that organized a better way. Right. And yeah. uh, I got involved in that because of the course I was teaching and what I was doing with that. Huh. And so, you know, a better way is now an important yeah, community yeah. agency yeah. helping abused women and their and their children. Um, and I haven't done anything with that agency in some number of years. But you know, I was back then able to get out into the community and do something like that that meant an awful lot to me. And those are just typical kinds of things I was doing at that time. Um, 
In more recent years, it's been more the typical kind of things you'd expect a, a faculty member to do. I get invited by one community group or another right, yeah. to come speak on something mm -hmm. uh, uh, that relates to my uh, field's uh, uh, expertise, mm -hmm. and especially the Soviet Union and then Russia mm -hmm. after that. And with the changes in the Soviet Union breaking up uh, uh, in the uh, early 90s, you know, people wanted to know what's going on there. Right. And, um, and then uh, the, the changes in Europe with the uh, end, end of the uh, Soviet control of Eastern Europe mm -hmm. in 1989, and the democratization of that whole string of states over there. Mm -hmm. It was such a drastic kind of change that it, it, it made a lot of people, both uh, news organizations and, and people and agencies in the community, want to know, what do you think about this? What's going on here? And so I, I, got, I got call after call after call from a newspaper to want to, want to uh, hear what I had to say about something that was going on in Europe. Or, um, or somebody would call and say, will you come speak to our group? Uh, churches, yeah, yeah. Uh, sector community agencies, all kinds of things like that, to, that I, where I had opportunities to speak. And um, so that's gone on right down to the present, really. Mm -hmm. do, do, you, do you think that the way you saw your life as a faculty member, both on and off campus, that there's a kind of almost seamlessness between um, town and gown, where there, there isn't any real barrier, as you might see it, between what you did on the campus and what you did to take your work as an academic into the community? Yeah, there was for me. I didn't see barriers between town and gown. And, okay. and you know, if there, if there are negative feelings in Muncie about uh, Ball State and faculty members and things like that, I, I never personally experienced that. Okay. And, and the, the, the kind of second phase of my career where I was not on TV and radio, but out in the community meeting with groups and and, and speaking to groups and that sort of thing, I always found them really receptive and okay. friendly, and I, I didn't yeah. see any real conflict there. Okay. And sometimes, you know, you, if you met with a group that had people who were professionals of some sort, uh, who had advanced degrees maybe themselves, you would expect them probably to feel comfortable with you, but I found that no matter what the group was like, uh, what its composition, uh, educationally and otherwise, uh, that the, the conflicts just weren't there. I, I didn't sense okay. it. Okay. What, you know, this is a tough question, but I got to ask it anyway. What you stayed here as long as you did. I mean, what? How do you view the Muncie community as a as a place to live, as a place to raise children, and things of that kind? When we came here in 1969. Uh, we had three children. Uh, the eldest was born in '64, and our fourth child was born in '69. A few months after we got here. Uh, so our Two boys and two girls were really little then, and they grew up here. Um, three of them went to Ball State. One of the youngest wanted to quit being the baby of the family, so she wanted to go somewhere else to a big university. She went to Indiana University. Yeah. Um, and I've, I've always said, and I still feel this way, that this, this was really a, a good place okay. for our children to grow up. Um, uh, good schools. There were some problems at times. Uh, one of the elementary schools was just not right for our two youngest children, and uh, they went to Burroughs, and Burroughs turned out to be a really good e learning experience yeah. for them, and, and a good place to be in other respects, too. Yeah. Um, and Ball State, you know, uh, drew a, a lot of uh, cultural uh, kind of, of experiences into the community that wouldn't have been here otherwise, sure. everything from right. popular entertainment to famous speakers, you know. Yeah, yeah. My kid didn't. Hearing, but I heard Ashley Montague sure. and <laughs> and uh, various and sundry other famous scholars and uh, and Ralph Nader and <laughs> and some of the yeah. student radicals of, of the late 60s, early 70s came here, um, and and Ball State bringing those kind of people here made it a good good community for me and and yeah. and for our, our children too, um, yeah. and then the community itself uh, apart from what Ball State uh, had to do with the way the community is. Um, not long after we came here, we got, we, we got to know Hurley Goodall, who was the first African American uh, elected to the state legislature, I think. First one from here. First, first, first one elected, from here. Yeah, first one from here. From here. And first, and first, first we elected the school board. School board, that's right. We got involved in his yeah. election campaigns for school board and state legislature. Yeah. And, um, th and we got to know a lot of people in the black community uh, at that time and, and still have uh, friends uh, that we have fairly close contact with there, and that's been a really good thing. Um, and I, that would have happened anywhere, I suppose, but it happened here. Mm -hmm. um, I, 
uh, other kinds of things about about Muncie. Uh, there are a lot of you know, I don't like the ur urban sprawl that made downtown Muncie almost die now. It seems to be coming back right. and and the city move out along 332. Right. But that's ha happening everywhere. It's happening in my hometown. Right. Right. Um, so it was a good it was a good size place. It was big enough, but not too big. Okay, we're back at it. Okay. We were talking about a town gown yeah. question before. Yeah, and especially at, at the end about was yeah. this a good place to be all those years, a good community. Right. <clears throat> I, I emphasize, I guess, what it was for the kids in school and what it was for me. Um, and, and for me, it was, I could always do really interesting things, well, partly because both Ball State was here and the community was here as it is. For example, Minotrista Culture Center asked me to do um, a presentation on World War One posters. Oh yeah. yeah. Uh, and and graphic sure. design used in that right. way, and, and so Ball State has this huge collection right. of World War One posters, and I'd done some research in that, yeah. and done some writing in it, about it, in fact. Um, and so I said, yeah, you know, that's great. I'll do that. And then what? I wanted to get the resources together, the pictures to look at, the things to read about graphic design used in, in propaganda posters and that sort of thing. I've got all this here at Ball State, you know, and it's easy to get to. I said, I take a ton of stuff home. I worked off and on for weeks and weeks and weeks on putting this presentation together. And I go to Minotristic Cultural Center and I make this presentation. And the, the equipment I use and everything, you know, I got from Ball State because I'm, I'm a retired faculty member. And so I've got places in the community that are interested in what I want to do and what I have to say. And I've got the resources here at Ball State that enable me to do it pretty easily. And so yeah, that's been great for me. But if you think about it more from just the community side of things, is my wife has been a community person. Because she came here, you know, as, as a very active, community-oriented kind of person. She wanted to be involved in, in especially community politics. Yeah. And so she, she got in, she jumped right in feet first, you know. And, and, and she knows the community politically a lot better than I do. I always have to ask her advice, you know, about, well, who, who should I vote for, and that sort of thing. Yeah, right. and, and this was a place where she could do that. Now, maybe it would have been that way anywhere at all, but as, as it happened, we, we've been here 35 years, and this is the place where she did that. Mm -hmm. And so she's been involved in League of Women Voters this whole time that we've been here, um, and a number of other community agencies. She was, uh, oh, and when, when Nan decided she uh, wanted to go back to school, she got an undergrad degree in, in English. And uh, then she worked in a bank, and then she didn't work for a number of years when the kids were little, and then she got, you know, overwhelmed with just being at the home woman all the time. And so she decided, I got to. When, when as soon as the kids were all in, in school of some sort, she decided she wanted a master's degree. Well, she she came to Ball State to get a master's degree in political science, and ended up making it public administration, political science. And then she, she for two years she was uh, personnel director for the city of Muncie, and so you know she she had those kinds of opportunities here. Uh, that well, again, she she might have had those anywhere else, but she she got them here, and she was able to to, to do a lot of things she wanted to do in in that way. And uh, w when she uh, decided that uh, having to worry about keeping your job every time there was a, a mayoral election, she thought, well, maybe uh, city government's not where I want to be. And so she almost immediately got this job at Delco Remy and Anderson, and she and so for years she commuted back and forth to Anderson and had a really good career going <coughs> over there. <coughs> until the uh, corporation started going down the tubes. <clears throat> then they gave her a, a chance to retire early from there. Yeah. And so she took early retirement from there. And the very same week, she came over here and went to work as an academic advisor. Yeah. And she took a much more varied career than you had. Yeah, yeah. And she was an academic advisor then uh, uh, for uh, most of the 90s at Ball State. Well, you know, this is the kind of place where you could do that. Right. And once, once we could afford it well enough, and, and, and had the time with the children being old enough to travel uh, abroad. Uh, you know, it's an hour, hour over an hour's drive to the airport in Indianapolis, and from there... You can go anywhere. You can go anywhere, yeah. Right. And, uh, and if you want to go to a bigger place to shop or go out uh, yeah. to an uh, um, art museum somewhat bigger than, than ours here on, at, on campus or whatever, you've got Indianapolis okay. and Chicago is not that far away, going. you know. <laughs> So yeah, it was, it was a great place in that respect. This sounds like a great uh, chamber of commerce speech here for, for living in well, Muncie. <laughs> if, I, if I told you the dark, darker side. <laughs> darker side. Well, this, like, may not, this may not be a, a transition <clears throat> to the darker side, but my, uh, I guess, grand finale uh, question uh, in, in this series of interviews I'm doing is to ask you to, I guess, conclude by giving me your perspectives on 
the role of the faculty at Ball State? In the university, our, what our role is? Yes, in, oh. in, yeah. Well, oh, okay, it, it no. may be, I guess, I'm not trying to put words in your mouth. I certainly would never, uh, never do that, John. But it's more talking about the concept that we hold near and dear to our hearts of shared governance. I mean, just reflecting back on your career as you see the, the role of the faculty in the institution, uh, you know, has that role changed? Mm -hmm. uh, maybe it's better now, maybe it's not so great, but just to think yep. of a almost four decade long career here and to talk about the faculty, because most of these interviews are going to be done with faculty members. Yeah. Well, if, if I say what I, I see as the most obvious aspect of, of that question, um, in the early years here, the, the faculty seemed to have a lot more influence through the faculty senate okay. on, on what goes on in the institution okay. than they do now. Um, that, that they reorganized, you know, and, and uh, right. instead of having a faculty senate, it became a university right. senate. Right. And when they, when, once they did that, it seemed to me like the, the light kind of went out of the faculty politically. Okay. Um, the faculty I <clears throat> can still obviously have influence on what goes on here in a number of different ways, but uh, I, I don't think the faculty has the kind of power, let's call it, uh, in the institution that they had in uh, the, my first decade and okay. plus here. And um, it, hasn't, it hasn't made things necessarily worse that it's that way, um, but I may, maybe it's made the faculty somewhat less, I don't know what to call it, community spirited. Okay. So that you know, our, our job becomes just teaching, or, and, or just teaching and research and publication, and and less us working together to run Ball State. Okay. But I think that that at a, at another level, the faculty have stayed involved. For example, um, I, I was uh, involved with a, uh, the faculty administrative group <coughs> that started the uh, uh, freshman connections program, and we and we started working before that on on various kinds of things about the freshman year experience. Right. And um, so that as a faculty member, I could be involved with a lot of my colleagues in both the administration and the faculty and working on, on making the freshman year here something really different and I think better. And so working in that way, uh, faculty members have a lot of influence. And, um, <clears throat> and there were an awful lot of other things going on. Like when we, when we started shifting over toward um, um, computer uh, use of computers in class, um, and and eventually the use of other forms of information and visual media in classes. Um, I've been doing what I call visual teaching for a long time. I started work going in that direction in the late '60s and had sort of done my own version of it. But uh, when uh, Ray Steele came here, and uh, it, there was a new kind of push toward using computers and and other and and videos and that sort of thing, and so. Uh, I got involved with several faculty groups that went through uh, training sessions, workshops, and so forth um, uh, that, that helped me learn how to use uh, video equipment that I had not used before. And so the, in that case, I wasn't making the decisions about what to do, but I was working with other faculty members in helping to change Ball State. Okay. And um, some people don't like computers, and some people don't like the Internet and all that, but Ball State has done a great job, you know, of, of gearing up for that and making it become a real and valuable part of what Ball State is, to be that high tech in, in ways that I think are mostly really good. And faculty members at, at working with administrators have, have shaped that a great deal. And so uh, instead of having a faculty senate where, you know, sort of the political things all happen, it's like we've got all these other subparts of the structure where faculty members are involved and, mm -hmm. and so that their role is, 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 is still not just teaching and just research and publication and those kinds of things that mm -hmm. faculty members think of as being their life. It is also sort of uh, running Ball State and reshaping Ball State in those kinds of ways. Did, did you get the feeling <coughs> over time that, you know, this is again pretty blunt, but from, from my perspective uh, as provost, that the administration paid attention to the faculty voice, if you will, no matter how it might have been articulated more when you first came here or more when you, say, were in your last decade or so. I, I really think that in spite of the fact that 
not having a faculty senate anymore, as I guess, might have made the faculty feel less kind of aware of being a part of this whole university community right. than they used right. to. Uh, that uh, I can't say that the administration was any less responsive okay. to faculty members. Um, I, that, I didn't see that change really. Okay. How about the department? I mean, oftentimes I hear people say that when they came here, as we did, you know, three or so decades ago, that there was more camaraderie among colleagues. There in was. The yeah. department. Oh, there was. Okay. Yeah, that. That changed a lot, and even young faculty members talk about it. They okay. they they, don't, they weren't here in the, uh, when in those years when we had um, the kinds of activities that we right. had that made us feel really yeah. close. Yeah. Um, but they're aware that that's missing, and and the younger faculty members, when I was chair, they talked to me about that a lot. Okay. They they wish yeah. they had that kind of camaraderie yeah. that they had heard we had, yeah. or that they they knew just by whatever means that they wanted that, and they they didn't have it. And they work at it a little bit. Yeah. Um, right. One one uh, member of the department uh, uh, got the faculty together at his house for carrying dinner at the beginning of the school year, okay. and they they they've tried to do those kinds of things, right. but it still hasn't worked it r really well. Uh, my oldest daughter is 42, and uh, the, we, we went to a, uh, a church retreat this past weekend, and uh, she's gone for the last five years. It's uh, uh, up in northern Indiana, on one of the in one of the state parks on the lake, in this beautiful setting, you go there uh, Friday and then come back Sunday midday. Mm -hmm. And she has two daughters now, uh, 13 and 11, and her daughters have gone all, all five years with her. And um, it's, it's kind of a rustic place, and they sleep on mm -hmm. cots in these little cabins right. and all that kind of thing. And, and they just love doing that. And when they left, they uh, the girls uh, were real tired, so they slept all the way home, mm -hmm. two-hour drive. When they got home. They, they, they were in, in tears, and they're not much inclined to do that because this retreat this year is over, and there won't be another one until mm -hmm. next year. Mm -hmm. And Christy said, you know, yeah. um, that's the 42-year-old daughter. Right. She said, they feel about that like I used to feel about those history uh, picnics at the beginning of the school year. And she talked about going down to the park in Newcastle and, and the kids all running around and playing together, your children and mine. Yeah, okay. And she said, when that was over every year, <laughs> I, was, I was really down in the dumps <laughs> because it was so much fun doing that. Well, I don't think that happens anymore in, with the history faculty, uh, not to, certainly not to that extent. And, and it wasn't just the faculty members in the department, it was the families. Mm -hmm, that's true. And the families were together and the families knew each other. Yeah. And, and uh, since we had left uh, the South, and come up here. We were, uh, you know, an eight-hour drive from any relatives. I grew up with my cousins, you know. Right. They were my best friends right. too, and there were a bunch of them. Yeah. Um, that my children didn't have that, but but in, in a way, the camaraderie in our department helped them to get something of that. Mm -hmm. I like Even though we weren't yeah. together uh, frequently, yeah. we were together enough, you know, that they they knew each other and they liked being together, and it was a wonderful time. And yeah. I think that was really good. Yeah. I, I, and that's I, gone. Yeah, I do. I, I think that's changed because of the. Oh, the role of faculty and what are what's expected of faculty. Mm -hmm. I, I think that there's much less of that kind of department as community yeah. as there was uh, when we came here. Right. Yeah. And there, um, you know, there were some villains in the community. <laughs> I'm not saying there were villains. A few that I didn't get along with, and, I, and in fact, some of them who didn't like what, me because of, I guess, yeah. partly because of the way I talked. <laughs> right. It was too radical for them. Yeah. And, but I didn't know until later about some of those how much they disliked what I was doing. And, yeah. And it was it was like the older members of the faculty in the department, especially, but some outside of the department, yeah. they covered my back, yeah, right. and they kept the villains from getting me, and they did. And you know, Carson Bennett, I still remember an AAUP meeting. We were yeah. talking about teaching methods one time, and one of the department's <laughs> villains was there and, and didn't like what I said about what I, how I thought you should teach. And uh, Carson said, uh, I still this was in the arts building, as yeah. vivid as anything right now. I remember him standing there saying. The older faculty members here who are tenured and secure, they've got to protect the younger generation here or they're going to be in trouble. I don't know that he personally did anything, but there, there were people in the, in the senior faculty who did things to help oh, yeah. cover the backs of the younger yeah. faculty members yeah. who wanted to do some rather different kinds of things. I think that's unquestionably true. And that, you know, that's camaraderie, yeah. and that's a, a kind of, of community spirit, if you want to call it that, within ac the academic world that I think was really good. Yeah. Anything else you want to add? No. <laughs> <laughs> no. This has been great. I really appreciate your doing this. Sure. Uh, as I said uh, when I interviewed other colleagues for this project, that uh, probably somebody will ramble around the archives in the year 2050 and find all these.
transcripts and tapes and say, gee, I wonder what these people had to say. Yeah, they need to know we went to Newcastle Park and played yeah, right. touch football. <laughs> and we used to play also at store. Yeah. Boys had us get together. Yeah, that's morning, right. You know? That's right. To, to say nothing of, uh, of having uh, rather interesting picnics in Paul Mitchell's backyard. Oh, yeah. Right. <laughs> right. That was great. Thank you very much. Sure. I really appreciate it.